All right, guys, so I just finished the podcast with Mark Dos Santos. If you don't know who he is, former head coach of the Vancouver Whitecaps, assistant coach with LAFC and Bob Bradley, also was an assistant coach at CF Montreal, also known as, or formerly known as Impact de Montreal. So an amazing podcast, very exciting. Um, we talk about everything from what you know he looks for in goalkeepers, all the way from you know how to define your own success and why that's important. We also talk about everything football. So make sure you guys check it out. If you like this content, drop a like. And if you're not subscribed, what are you doing? I think many times, many times in sports or in life, uh, we don't appreciate or we take for granted the opportunities that we have. We don't allow the time to just stop and appreciate what we have now. Today, it doesn't matter what happened yesterday or what's gonna happen tomorrow. Make it count today. Make it count by your attitude, by your mentality, by your individual commitment. So I ask you today, just appreciate the opportunity that we have because at the end of the day, if we win today, nobody's gonna think about yesterday. Nothing else, nothing that could be written, not that what they have and what we don't. The 90 minutes, guys, today we make it count. Hello. Hey, how are you? Good, how are you? Can you hear me well? Uh, yeah, can you hear me? Yeah. Awesome, awesome. You have the best flag in the world behind you. <laughs> I know, my, my family's uh, originally from Quebec, so, um, you know. You didn't, you, didn't, you didn't tape this, no, my comment. Oh, no, I'll make sure I edit that out. Because, no, I'm joking with you. Oh, oh okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to say um, thank you so much for coming on. Um, it's really cool. You're especially as a player right now. You're always a coach that um, I've admired. So it's it's really exciting to to have you on. And uh, I think a lot of people uh, on the podcast can learn from you as well as I. So extremely excited to to have you here. Cool. You're where are you living now? Uh, so right now um, I'm living in Rhode Island, uh, but. I'm actually on trial with a team in Nisa in New York. So I've been going back and forth. Oh, cool. So yeah. Rhode Island, New York. Uh, no, no, no. Rhode Island. And I'm going to New York. Oh, you're going to back New and York. Forth. Okay. So I played What's in exactly Boston. Rhode Island. Um, it's, it's, new, it's in New England. So it's kind of, uh, I don't know if you know Massachusetts, but it's. Uh, yeah, yeah, I do. Okay, okay, okay. I know, I know more or less the area. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And I spent some time um, in Montreal with Concordia, um, with Greg, uh, Greg Sutton and everything. So oh, cool, um, cool, 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 cool. Awesome. So, so you're Canadian. Canadian. You're Canadian. Uh, dual citizen. So Amer American as well. Okay. As Canadian, so. And you have your soccer podcast for how many years now or months? Um, I just started this year. Um, okay. Something that I, I really wanted to do because um, I've always been a big believer in trying to kind of inspire others and right. um, through through my journey and, and just hearing other people's perspectives of the game, especially of life too. Okay, cool. Awesome. Cool. Yeah. So um, one of my first questions for you, and I always kind of like to um, hear about this stuff is if you could describe what it means to, to win in one word, what what would that word be and why? passion mm -hmm. you know i think uh, if i could if i could relate winning with one word passion because uh, passion is uh, what fuels everything i i don't see winning without passion i don't see good training without passion passion brings intensity brings commitment uh and when i think about winning i associate uh that you know awesome Awesome. That's I always trying to describe it in one word, but yeah, as soon as you ask me the question, it's the first word that popped on my head. Okay, that's interesting. That's 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 awesome. So now switching more through um, a coaching perspective, through your journey of coaching, what mm -hmm. have you found the best way of getting a team to to buy into your philosophy, especially when you know if you're starting 
a new team or just being a new coach in general, going to different teams, how have yeah. you found, uh, you know, that, that way to gel those guys together? Cause everyone has a different background personalities. You know, look, it's a really good question because I, I was counting the other day. It's been a, a good time for me to reflect and see, uh, how I want to grow also as a coach and what I learned with Vancouver and, going through through all of that i realized that um the groups that you have the type of groups that you have really allow you to establish a culture okay um that i realized and learned a lot in the last few years but for you to to bring a message to the locker room that is is uh as the ability to, to make people gel, uh, the word that comes to my head is clarity. Clarity and, uh, and consistency. So uh, when you're not consistent with your, your model of play, with training, with decisions, it, it, it's, that lack of consistency is gonna bring some gray areas to the locker room and it's gonna bring a lack of clarity. And I felt that what helped me with, with many clubs is to have a very clear and consistent uh, way of working and inside a model. And when I wasn't consistent with a model, because also as a coach, I, I had bad moments. And when I learned that my my the times where I succeeded as a coach and won trophies as a coach was when the level of clarity and consistency in what we're doing was very high, also attached to a locker room that was very experienced and commitment and committed. When these two things are not there, it's hard to win. Wow, that's that's really interesting. I, I that's that's really cool to to kind of see that insight because I think that's something that uh, not everyone takes into account, especially when you know you're you're looking at coaches and stuff. You don't realize how you know difficult and how challenging it can be sometimes to actually get a group to gel together. So I always find that stuff. Yeah, uh, yeah, and look, I, I don't consider myself an old coach. Mm -hmm. uh, because I'm 44 years old. But the thing is, I started my career very, very early. At the age of 27 years old, I was coaching the reserve team of back then the Montreal Impact. So now it's been 15 seasons in a row, not stopping. And I could tell you there's a big change in society, a huge, huge change. I, I, I speak with people about that. My locker room, when we won the USL championship with Montreal, it was men. They were men. Uh, when I think about guys like Matt Jordan, Adam Braz, Mauro Biello, Nevio Pizzolito, David Testo, Leo Di Lorenzo, Roberto Brown, they were all men. You know, they didn't need after training to go on their cell phones. And, and even that time, there wasn't that much of Twitter and Instagram. And now you're coaching a society, 50 like so many years later, that is totally different. The teams are younger. The teams are younger. And you see it in, um, in hockey, I think. You see it in many sports. The players are just younger. You don't have that those older guys playing and have, having a beer after that. I hear so many stories of the Montreal Canadiens and how hockey was back then. And now, no. So it's a change of society, but I don't think we got tougher. You know what I mean? Hmm. If I'm being bluntly honest, the team I coached in Montreal in 2009, they were tough. They were tough, but they were also men. And even the team I coached in San Francisco when we won the NASL, they were tough, but they were a lot of men, a lot of guys married with kids, men, men that were accountable. And then when, when I got to coach more younger teams, even at the professional level, I saw a lot of, of um, a huge lack of 
paying a price of commitment sometimes of um, of uh, courage i would call it courage you know uh, ending a game i remember a game with the white caps and it's not a critic to the players it's just a critic to society and the players know how i felt because I said, guys, why don't you shove your cell phone where I'm thinking? You know, I said that in the law. We just finished a game against the Galaxy where we tied 1-1 away and the, the stadium of LA was packed. And we get back into the locker room and nobody is in the shower. They didn't even take their socks off. They're all on their cell phone, not even talking with each other. Hmm. So... I'm telling you that, you know, to, to elaborate on your question, uh, you bring a message to a locker room. You also have, as a coach, to kind of adapt to the type of locker room you have. Mm -hmm. I felt that the kids I coached in Palmeiras, U15, were incredibly tough. So sometimes it's not only a question of age, it's a question of the upbringing. So I have this U16 team coach that I'm coaching of Palmeiras, and they're incredibly tough. And then I started to understand why. It's because one million other kids want to take their spot in the Academy of Palmeiras. And all of that together makes it how guys are being upbrought and how guys grow in the system. And, and right now we live in a society, and Canada has a lot of it, and I'm very a big public critic of that. Our young players are not tough. Our young players are not tough. They don't go through the right environment. They don't, many times, they don't pay enough of the price, you know, and uh, they, we need to find a way to, to get to the next level, but it's, it's just our society is right now. That's a that's a really interesting point because even though I'm young, I'm only 21. Um, mm -hmm. Just through playing through through different teams and starting to move up to different levels, um, I've definitely kind of seen what you speak about at, at certain points. So it's definitely interesting um, that you brought up that that point because I think as well, just being tough as well physically, being tough mentally is such a huge part of, of football. It is. The game. It is. It is, man. For players and for coaches. You, you have to embrace the word no. You have to embrace when you think you're not going to make it. You have to embrace when guys pull you back down. That's necessary ingredients for you to succeed. If you never go through that, look, I, I give my example in coaching. I had to go through a tough spell with a club because before Vancouver, I always won. So if my life would always be of winning, it would be it would be incredibly unrealistic for my next step as a coach. So players have to understand that sometimes if they don't play or if they go out on loan, I remember having conversations with Tio Bear, with um, Matteo Campagna, with Damiano Pecile, kids that I would tell. Guys, it is necessary for you to go on loan, pay a price, get into an uncomfortable zone and prove that you belong at a certain level. And some players embrace that. Other players say, no, why? I don't need to. So no, I'm supposed to play here. And, and, and I, I, I think it's the, right, uh, the wrong attitude to have. Yeah, that's interesting because especially for me, just as, as a human being, as a player, um, from a young age, I always viewed the word no or, you know, failure as basically showing you the way. I think a lot of people will look at a setback as a slam door in their face, but mm -hmm. in actuality, it's just showing you what you can improve on, uh, yeah. as well as giving you motivation and fire to, yeah. um, to keep going. Yeah, so. that, that's the attitude you need to have. That's the attitude you need to have. And I also have to say, too, just I've been around a lot of players that have, you know, made it to the MLS very, very young or different leagues very young. And a lot of those times, the kids that don't, like you said, experience rejection or hear the word no, sometimes tend to uh, just fizzle out. And because they're not used to, to being uncomfortable in those situations, um, sometimes can, can play an impact. So that was yeah. actually a very interesting point that, that you brought up. 
So um, my next question, and I'm just interested to hear this from just a uh, kind of just learning about the game more as I, as I talk to people, um, you really f- seem to favor the 4-3-3 the three, three attacking um, like uh, setup and, and p- position. So I'm interested to hear why. Um, no, it's it, look. I think it's a, it's a little bit of a unfair judgment on me that I, I I seem to prefer that, and maybe it's written in the internet or in my transfer market. But look, uh, when we won the USL with Montreal in two thousand and nine, we played with a in a four four two with a diamond midfield. Okay, then uh, when I was in Ottawa, we played in a four three three. When I was in Swope Park Rangers, we played in a 4-2-3-1. So it was like an hybrid 4-4-2 with a number 10. That was the, the, the kid, Ayrton Pinheiro. Then when I won the NASL with uh, San Francisco, we played in a 3-5-2. So I would tell you this. Because of the occupation on the field, I really like the 4-3-3 because I think it allows you to press, to stretch the field offensively, to have a lot of cover defensively. Um, And to attack, you know, you have always right angles of pass. Uh, The two number eights could support the number nine or the wingers. Um, Then it's your decision if you have in your profile wingers that are better touching the line or playing more inside. but I've I've started to learn and like a lot the three four three, you know. What I think is very important is for you to adapt to the players that you have, mm. and if you go to a team that there's no good wingers, let's say you don't really have a good wingers or a a target or a target number nine, and you try to force a system that is yours, but that doesn't suit the guys that you have. I think it's a huge mistake. Um, Let's say you arrive in a club tomorrow where you have two very good mobile forwards. And then because, and you don't have wingers, maybe you should think about the 3-5-2 or the the 4-4-2 to use very well those two mobile forwards, right? So I think that uh, maybe I played more games in my career in a 4-3-3. This is why it shows Mm -hmm. me as a 4-3-3. But in reality, the, 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 the trophies I won in the NASL, in the USL, were all in different systems. 4-4-2 diamond, 3-5-2, 4-3-3, 4-2-3-1. Um, but they were all in clubs where we were consistent with it. Hmm. And, uh, and what I learned is when you're not consistent with it because your roster sometimes doesn't allow you to be, uh, that's where you don't succeed as a coach. Okay, that's interesting. So behind the scenes, as as a coach, say you're thrown into a new team, what is kind of how do you go through that process of figuring out what you feel would be the best formation uh, for the team? You know, I was thinking about that. If tomorrow I arrive in a club that I have a clean sheet, like I had in San Francisco and Ottawa, clean, that there's no players, I build from start. I would probably evaluate very well the league I was in to allow me to to choose the best way of playing for that league Mm. because some leagues are very particular. You you know, if you play in the championship in England, you play against a a lot of direct type of styles. You know, the second league in Portugal is very different than the first league. So that could also limit you uh, on... How do you want to play? How do you see the model? How ty- what type of players? Then there's the other scenario. You arrive in a team that already has players signed to a contract. So you have to live with maybe 70% of the roster. Mm. And now based on that, how do you want to play? And that I think it would take a lot of uh, looking back at previous games, that how they played as a team, how do you see they can improve and maybe meet with the leadership group of the team, four or five guys. And I would go about it asking them what's comfortable for them. 
you know, because I don't believe that the coach alone makes the team. I don't believe in that. I think the institution makes the coach, the coach and the makes the players, and the players also make the coach. You know, I I always give an example. Look at FC Porto, an example of an institution making the coach. The club is so strong in its foundations at Porto, so, so strong that Jose Mourinho went to Chelsea, Villas Boas went to Chelsea, Paul Fonseca went to Shakhtar Donetsk, uh, Nuno Spirit Santo is now at Tottenham. Uh, now Sergio Conceição is the coach, but at any time he could go somewhere because the, the club's foundation is so strong in the winning mentality to succeed that the coach succeeds automatically. When a club is depending only on a coach to build the club, it's because the club has zero foundations and the club is very weak in the winning mentality. So every time you evaluate a club, you have to also evaluate who are the coaches from that club that left to better places or that left to higher places. And that's going to give you a very good idea on the foundations of the club. That's really interesting. That's awesome. So um, there, I, I'm a goalkeeper personally, and there's a lot mm -hmm. of goalkeepers that, that listen to this podcast. Yeah. So from, from a coach, from a coaching perspective, um, you know, if you're looking for goalkeepers to join your team, or if you're just, if you're just watching a game, what would you say are the top three qualities you look for? And then on top of that, what are the top three qualities that would catch your eye uh, for, of a goalkeeper? Because I've always been interested in that. Some, a lot of different. Look, there, there, let's start with the romantic part of the game right now that everybody loves. And because there's a lot of uh, good coach, there's a lot of coaches that won every game that they played, every single game they played. And you know why? Because they never coached one single game. So everything they, they write looks good because they never coached a game. They don't understand the dynamic of coaching and winning and losing. And so there's, there's a side that is very romantic in the game today. It's the ball possession, the keeping the ball, the playing out of the back. Yeah, because when you're not under pressure to win games, you could throw that out and, you know, it doesn't count. But let's bring that point to start with the goalkeeper. And you've heard that a lot. The ability of the goalkeeper to play with his feet. It's a talk and a topic that has been a lot out there. Okay. Uh, but I remember a goalkeeper that I had in Ottawa and in San Francisco that is now the goalkeeper coach of... Um, of the CF Montreal, Romuald Pézé. And Romuald helped me win in Ottawa, helped me win in San Francisco by his leadership, by his management of the game, was very frustrating. If we were one, one, one not, nothing up, the game was over. Because I think him alone would spend, would lose 15 games, 15 minutes in a game. Goal kick, he would walk. He would go on the ground, frustrating to play against, great for a coach, great management, great leadership, worked extremely hard in training, made the save. Because the goalkeeper doesn't make, need to make 20 saves. He needs to make the save that keeps you in the game. And he always ended up making that save that would keep us in the game. And I, I look for these qualities. And why I say him? It's because he was very average with his feet, very average. But we didn't use him a lot. So we played in a way that we didn't have to lose, use him a lot. And at the end of the day, we won a lot of trophies with him in two different clubs. Why? Because all his other qualities uh, just erased the, 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 the fact that he was just okay with his feet. But now there's this romantic side of first, the goalkeeper has to be a number 10. So if he's a number 10 with his feet, why don't you play as an attacking midfielder? The guy, poor guy is a goalkeeper, you know? So I think that that, that first topic with the feet has to be something already discussed in a, in a, in a different way, okay? But yes, 
you know, let's say you're looking at a goalkeeper. Me, I look at one leadership and communication qualities. Uh, I, I think that's very important. Two, does he know his position in the goal? And positioning in goal is so important because it's everything uh, when the goalkeeper is in place, but the bar is the ball is far. And you see the good goalkeepers are always connected with the line of the ball. They travel with the ball, even with if the ball is in the opponent's midfield. And this is something that I look a lot because when you play with a higher line, you need to make sure that your goalkeeper reads the tra trajectory of the ball, you know? And then my, my last quality is the ability to, to play with his feet, because I think if the other two qualities are so good in the goalkeeper, why would I like look at the feet as number one? But of course that in today in the modern game and our, our playing out of the back, the pass back to the goalkeeper is important. It's definitely something to, to, to work on uh, if you're a goalkeeper, but don't make it your number one thing just because you're reading so much about it. And it's such a romantic BS side of the game that people just talk because they're never under pressure you know they're never in that bench uh, paying a price so nah the goalkeeper should play with his feet coach should use his goal goalkeeper yeah because you're not there taking decisions you win every game because you haven't coached one single game in your life you know so look i would focus if you i'm a goalkeeper on your leadership and communication qualities because you're the the player that sees everything in front of you your position compared with the ball, of course, I don't need to talk to you about, oh, your ability to come out in crosses, shot stopping, because if you don't have that, you can't be a goalkeeper to start, right? And, and then uh, I, I would say, yes, your ability to improve your footwork and, and, and playing with your feet is, is important today. That's awesome. That's a really interesting perspective on that because I'm uh, one of the goalkeepers that I watch a lot is uh, Maximum Crepo, just because yeah. I try to watch goalkeepers that are around my height and I'm only 5'11", so I'm technically mm -hmm. shorter for, you know, the the mark I feel like of, of professional goalkeepers. So yeah. I just found that interesting just to kind of see that that connection. Look, when, when I arrived in Montreal and uh, Vancouver, uh, it was the first player I wanted to sign. And I got the no MLS experience, no uh, too short, uh, chubby-ish, a little bit. He needs to be careful with his weight, this and that. All the points were more into the negative. Mm -hmm. I just succeeded in the USL. And today, for me, is top five goalkeepers in the MLS. And I, I, there's something I won't even say here, because if I say it publicly, it's going to get me in trouble, so I won't. But for me, Max um, is a great example of that. Yeah, height is important. Okay, how much is it important? Mm. Did you see Switzerland, France in the Euro? Yes. The goalkeeper that knocked out France is my size, you know? So, and, and I was just in Belfast watching Northern Ireland against Switzerland. And I realized, man, he's really small, the guy plays in Bundesliga, Swiss national team. So at the end of the day, I think we have to look at, does he do the job? Does the goalkeeper do the job? How is he in these points that I took to you, spoke to you about? And Max is still a young goalkeeper. And Max is still growing and Max is still, still has a great future in front of him. That's awesome. That's awesome to hear that. So um, to another question that I'd be interested to hear is, Especially, um, you know, for me and other listeners, when, you know, my goal is obviously to, to play the game as long as I can and, and stick around for as long as I can. But after that, um, I, I would love to, to get into the coaching world. And yeah. um, it's always interesting to hear what advice would you have for people that are looking to kind of start a, 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 a professional coaching career? Like, what would you say is like the first building ground of that, you know? Yeah. Look, I'll tell you this. Uh, because when I talk with people that are still playing, 
is uh, until when do you want to play? So what does it mean to what does it mean to play the longest I can? You know, me, I realized at the age of 24 that I would not play at a big level. And I started in a relentless way to pursue my coaching journey, relentless way. So I was able to completely turn the page and say, okay, you know, let me stop. I could, I, I was a level of a USL player more or less. And, you know, I said, okay, where is this going to bring me in life? So I said, I want to coach. And when I decided that I wanted to coach, I, I, I went after it in a, in a, in a relentless way. And my, my first comment is, until when? when when's that coaching uh, playing uh, until you can? What does it mean? Maybe you could play at a very low level until you're 40. Mm. Maybe you could play a semi-pro or League One Ontario until you're 38. I don't know. What does that mean? Because one thing that helps you as a coach it's starting the process the earliest possible. Mm. So you're always in between this of, okay, when do I stop playing and when do I start coaching? And But you know that the sooner you start mm. working on becoming a coach, it's going to give you a better chance to succeed or to have opportunities. So it's very much um, an individual thing. As a, as a human, we're all different. Uh, some are going to force and try to get to their dream. I have a guy that I know, he's, he's 32 now, and he lives in LA, and he messaged me some, sometimes, Mark, I'm getting ready for a tryout. And I go, buddy, maybe you should stop thinking about becoming a pro player. Mm -hmm. You're 32, tryout of what? You know, maybe think about something else. But that's the fine line until when and when do you start studying to become a coach you have to find out that very very clear in you and it's personal with everybody well that's interesting that that's that's a cool perspective on that um so this next question is a little bit um about life and philosophy um so one thing that I admire about you, um, just from watching you um, coach and, and all that stuff, you have mm -hmm. this intensity and this tenacity about you um, mm -hmm. that comes through very, very clear um, through, through videos. And so when things in life, like we kind of talked about earlier, um, you know, when setbacks come, when, um, you know, doors are closed, how do you stay motivated in those times? Because through my experience, a lot of times that I've heard the word no, or I haven't reached where I've wanted to be at a certain time, um, it's actually made me a better player, a better person. So what is kind of your, your way of, of, you know, making sure that, you know, you come back bigger, better, and stronger, like that mentality side of it. I, I'm really interested to, to yeah, hear. Yeah, look, I, maybe we won't, it won't resonate with you because it comes from a place of faith, you know? And I, uh, it's clear for me and I share it. I'm a guy that comes from a place of faith. So I understand that in life, and it, I don't say that because I heard a motivational speech or because I hear in the YouTube channels, uh, these motivation videos. No, it doesn't come at all from there. It comes that in life, you will have setbacks. Like, me, I believe it because it comes from faith. It comes from me believing in the Bible that it tells me that in life, I will have setbacks, okay? Others believe it not from the Bible. They just believe it because they have some experiences in life. But then growing in life, I saw friends of mine. I, uh, I had a friend of mine in Portugal, 18 years old, incredibly successful future going for him and uh, had a huge passion for moto, moto bikes yeah. and he got under a truck and uh, hit his head very hard 
and got into a state that is like a vegetable now, still alive, doesn't talk, uh, completely done, you know, with life. His girlfriend, when he, when that happened, left him at 18, 19 years old, and um, he's still alive, but he's just alive, you know. I I saw uh, friends close to me that are uh, brain tumor. 36 years old, brain tumor, and almost lost their life. So, and when I think and I look at all of that, I say, there's no doubt that in life you're going to have setbacks. And, you know, getting a no from a club, losing your job, getting fired, that has to fuel your level of ambition because now you're saying, wow, life is in, on track. When you live a life that you never have setback, buddy, I'm telling you, a setback is coming. And me, what helped me is I got messages when I was let go of Vancouver saying, hey, Mark, sorry for what happened. I don't, I don't resonate with that because for me, it's not sorry. It's great. Let's go. What's next? You know, and I remember when I spoke with in the locker room with the players when I left Vancouver, I spoke. I spoke with everybody and, you know, I was able to hug every player and I told them I'm really excited about the future because it's a new beginning. When you leave something behind, it's a new beginning. And that doesn't change my intensity, my tenacity, my willingness to move forward. It's just a next step. And I think that you have to embrace that in life. If you don't, if you don't, the day you will have setbacks, you'll be the first one to fall, you know? And I always said, I cannot be that one. There's no chance I'm going to be that guy, you know? And I, I'm excited about what's next. I don't have a clue what's next, but I'm excited about the invisible, about the future. And I want to be an example for others that, yeah, there are setbacks, but then how are you going to react to it? I learned a lot with the past, but I'll tell you this, okay? Have you ever paid attention to a 100 meter sprinter? Pay, pay, pay really attention to how he runs, okay? You never see him look to the side, never. He always looks forward. And I think there's so much to learn from that. And when your life is about a run, life is about a run. And in that run, sometimes you're going to slip. Sometimes you're going to have to jump over something. But man, always look forward. Always look forward because that's where the price is. So that's how I live my life. But again, I, it comes from a faith background that I don't hide. And it's who I am. And I respect other beliefs and I respect other position on people, but me, it comes from a, a faith background. So it's really hard to knock me down. Really, really hard to be honest. That's, that's awesome that you said that because um, I've noticed that people who have the ability to see what other people would call a setback, if they view that as just the next stepping stone, those people are usually the ones that keep going and get bounced up. But when yeah. people have that mentality of, all right, if something didn't work out exactly how they wanted to, it gets shut down and that's the, the only way for it. Um, mm -hmm. So that's really interesting to hear. Um, so to start wrapping it up, because I know you're a busy person, I don't want to take up too much of your time. Um, so I'm interested to hear your opinion on this or if you even have an opinion. I just finished uh, Arsene Wenger's book um, and he kind of talked about maybe more so in the States um, that you know, professional clubs. Which, which one? I just which finished one? the, um, the, my life in red, white, and blue. Sorry, 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 sorry. I'm leaving. I'll come back. This one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just finished that one. Oh, I just got it. I didn't read it yet. So it's oh, a okay. good book. It's, it's, it's very good. I, I won't ask the question then. Cause I don't want to, I don't want to spoil no, it. I, did, I just got it and I didn't read it because I have some books I have to read, but now that you're telling me this, I'm going to read it. 
Okay. Yeah. Um, do you want me to ask the question? I don't Yeah, want to... still okay. go. Yeah, no problem. So um, one of the interesting things that he said uh, in, a, in a chapter of the book was that cl clubs or teams in the U.S., professional teams need to get um, football away from universities because at the, like the way that it, it, the development is now, um, you know, that he kind of was talking about how it's going to be very hard for them to to get to the next level of like where they want to be. And I find this interesting because I played one year in the NCAA and then I also played in rescue in Quebec. And from my experience in the NCAA, it's very much so building the athlete, building a, 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 an almost like a bodybuilder. So not necessarily building a, a football, a footballer prototype in terms of physicality, but big, strong, and fast. When I went to Canada, it was more technical. Um, generally, the players were better, and it was more about tactics and and more the the football aspect of the game. So I, I'd be very interested uh, to hear your opinion on that. Look, I uh, my I have an opinion on the development of coaches in uh, in, uh, in in Quebec province, mm -hmm. uh, and I'm not talking about CF Montreal, Impact Montreal. I'm not talking about any of that. I'm talking about development of coaches in the province of Quebec through the DP, the B license, the, 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 the conferences that they organize. I've, I've coached in all of North America. You know, I've coached in, not all, but like I've, I was in, in, in Kansas City, in San Francisco, in LA in Vancouver, uh, in, in Ottawa, like I, I was around. And I think Quebec as by far of all of North America, the best system of developing coaches. I don't know if it's because of the culture also. I don't know if I remember being in St. Leonard and uh, being with guys like Mike, Mike Vitulano, Jason DeTulio in a cafe watching uh, Juventus, Juventus Milan or Champions League, Barcelona, Chelsea. Mm -hmm. And there's these guys from Algeria, Morocco, Italy, background. Culturally, I feel that it's above, but by far all the other places I saw development of coaches. So maybe for your experience, maybe when you were in Quebec, you were able to be more around that. Hmm. maybe it's one point I don't know I don't know when uh, when Arsene Wenger talks about developing to through university I think years ago MLS started with the draft because it la la land okay and la la land is oh look at the NFL look at the NBA let's do that also and then you 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 realize that the draft sometimes is for a very some some okay players only you know, but it looks like we're draft we were drafting Neymar or Messi. Mm -hmm. No, we're drafting a good little player from college. That's all you know. And sometimes every five six years comes a very good one. But I think that now that the development is going towards the clubs, mm -hmm. and and. When MLS started years ago, development was a lot through college, mm -hmm. but now slowly the clubs got into having their B team, U17, U19, U15, uh, U, U13, right? Mm -hmm. Slowly the college part is fading away. Mm -hmm. And you've seen it now more and more in MLS. There's more players coming like homegrown players and that is changing the landscape. And I think maybe when Arsene Wenger had those words, he didn't, he wasn't fully in with what is happening now with the academies in the MLS that is growing a lot. And that I think is going to take the place of college. Now, when you talk about building a lot of athletes versus the soccer aspect of it and, the, and learning the technique, the tactical part, I think it really goes region by region. Mm -hmm. It really depends what club you're in, you know, what development club you're in, uh, what what province you're in. You know, if if you go to 
Orlando, let's say, to an academy, your chances are that you're going to be around a lot of Brazilian people. Orlando has a lot of academies that are run by Brazilian people. And maybe, I'm just trying to give you an example fast. Maybe in Orlando, you're going to learn about a lot about technique and um, an individual part because it's very Brazilian. But now you go to LA, maybe the LA area, it, it's kind of different. It really depends on where you go. But I could tell you that Quebec, I felt when it comes to development of coaches, mm -hmm. I felt it was an area of North America. I'm not saying only Canada, I'm saying North America yep. that was above a lot of uh, other areas. That's that's interesting. Yeah, I think too, just the, the setup. And like I said, I just have experience through Quebec, but the setup um, is, is really professional there. And um, so just to kind of wrap it up, um, just to, uh, you know, end the podcast, uh, for me and other people, what advice would you have for players um, that are starting to get in that professional setting? What would you so what would you say is the best advice to to be able to stick around? I always like hearing different things because as a player, um, you know, my end goal is to to play in the CPL. And that's, I think, you know, what would be my definition of success and, and make me yeah. feel fulfilled. So yeah. uh, with the, that being said, what advice would you have for for younger players? Kind of, you, you, know, you said something very important. And, uh, you know, I could tell you right away that even if you don't play, if you don't end up playing at a certain level, you're a humble and smart guy. So you're going to end up doing something good, okay? Because you're not delusional. You know, I could see it in you. You're not a delusional guy. And you could, you, 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 you define your own success and where can you get. And that's very important because trust me, I met a lot of delusional players in my life. And their definition of success was all over the place, you know? But if I have one advice for young coaches or young players, be ready to pay the price. Be ready to pay the price because that, that uh, I would say that, that, that summarizes everything. Be ready to spend extra hours training. Be ready to say no to some things. Say no to some things. I remember when I was starting to study to become a coach, I didn't have money to pay my UEFA licenses and to go from Montreal to Europe, to come back, to do internships. So I had to pay the price by my friends all at cars. And me, I was in snowstorms taking the bus. And in Montreal, it sucks to take the bus and snowstorm and you're waiting out. You know what I'm saying. And my friends, hey, when are you going to have your car? I can't yet because I had to pay a price for something. But today I, I drive a better car than all of my friends did in the past, you know. So pay the price. Pay the price by saying no to things. Pay the price extra work. Pay the price when you fall to get up and go again. Pay the price of you have to go on loan and you're starting your professional career and you're in a club that has everything. And now you go on loan to a club that only has cold shower. And instead of a nice meal after training, you get an orange. Yeah, pay the price because you don't have enough young players and enough young coaches that want to pay the price. They just want to get there. Hmm. They just want to be in the position where you sign an autograph or you're known but the, the the process to get there they don't want and that I talk to you about this with passion because I lived this with a lot of players and it's frustrating and then sometimes you have even media asking me as a coach you know yeah but how come this guy's playing and you can't say everything because you don't want to play uh, you don't want to bring the player down uh, publicly but what you really want to say is because he's not willing to pay the price, mm -hmm. you know, and this is so important. That, that would be my number one uh, advice to any young coach or any young player.
that's awesome that you said that. And I, I really resonate with that just as a player, just to start getting, you know, starting my professional career, you know, in NISA and stuff, the amount of stuff that I've had to sacrifice that I try to like tell other players or friends, like it's unbelievable. Like most people wouldn't even know. So it's, it's really cool. To Look, I, I'll tell you this today. We live in a, in a, in a, in an environment that every everything is counted everything is counted by by the watch you know training is from 5 to 6 30. you have a performance team that tells you oh when they reach 8.0 training should be done and everything loading everything is under training everything is oh if if everybody in training goes 50 me too, I'll go 50. Mm. Everything is calculated, you know? But then they expect a top final pro product. You know what I mean? Yeah. The, the microwave pizza sucks. Can you eat it? Yes, but it's still microwave pizza. It sucks. And we have a, a, a microwave culture. And me, what I hope is that, and what I believe is the guys that are going to, be the difference makers are the guys that are not going to go through the microwave uh, process and they're going to go through the oven process, mm -hmm. the oven that takes time just to get heated and to go through it and get out of it. We need more people. And this is why I'll tell you this. There's no more captains. The captains today are because they played more time with the club. Oh, because they have more years in the club. Oh, because they train well. Because the real captains, you don't see some anymore. Who are the real captains? They don't exist anymore. And the ones that are real, people don't, don't like them because they're too real, you know? And it's due to the culture. So I encourage, man, young coaches and young players accept paying the price man pay the price go through the oven don't accept any microwave situation and um, give the extra it's if the training is 5 to 6 30 do more after do more maybe in the morning uh, pay the price all the time we don't have enough of that that's awesome i i cannot agree more with that i i really resonate with that so um yeah, that's pretty much it. Um, I just want to say a, a huge thank you for coming on. I know you're a busy man and you have a lot going on. No, but I'm not very busy lately, so it's okay. <laughs> well, I appreciate you taking the time to, to come on a podcast that's um, relatively new. So it, it just means a lot. And it was nice getting to chat and, and talk to you. And maybe one day I'll be playing against you, with you. You never know. But um, It's a yeah. small world. You never know. You never yeah. know. Absolutely. But yeah, thank you for, for coming on. And I hope you have the, uh, I hope you enjoyed it. And I hope you have a great rest of your day. Thanks, man. Thanks for the opportunity. Okay. Thank all you. the best, all the best with your work there. Thank you. You as well. Okay, man. Take care. You too.